in series for quite some time entitled The Supernatural. And that series has had a variety of different focuses, some of which have uh, centered on um, various things, love, uh, corresponding action, and faith is always infused in everything we do and everything we talk about uh, because we are a faith church or a faith ministry. Uh, more specifically, we are a word of faith church. Uh, God, the Lord uh, assigned me and called me to a, a, faith, a word of faith uh, sort of ministry, a word of faith ministry, which to me uh, was interesting because when the Lord called me into ministry, I was willing to go in whatever direction he led me into. Uh, I knew that the very name word of faith would uh, have a challenge to it in terms of producing a ministry like that and uh, but I've seen it done already I've seen word of faith ministries uh, become extremely successful already on a world scale and so I know it can be done here so we're just all the way out with it okay now with that said what we're teaching here again I want to disclose it's not the typical normal church stuff that you hear okay so in that regard, we may not be exactly um, progressive according to social standards uh, as it relates to the norm of what you'll hear in church. We are maybe also not as orthodox as the typical church uh, would be in terms of, I think at, at times you're going to hear some things said here that are shocking, that uh, can come across sometimes even, um, what's a good word? different or maybe razzle dazzle okay uh, but i love it and then we're gonna keep going and uh, the lord is giving us grace to do it so uh, i want you to be mindful to follow along with this because you want to learn how to act on the word that's the premise of what we deal with how do you act on it now in first john the fifth chapter the fourth verse as a title we're going to use for this particular study tonight, the title we're going to use is Faith Words, okay? Faith Words, that's the title that we're going to actually deal with tonight. Now, let's start, we've talked about what faith is, and faith is what? Faith is what? What is it? Assurance, and what else? Title deed. How do you get assurance uh, or title deed? How do you get it? By hearing the word. By hearing what? The word. So faith is an assurance that comes from hearing the word of God, right? Now, um, the part of faith, when you, let me say this. Let me back up. Let me back up. Glory be to God and mercy. Let me get this out right. So I've gotten born again. Okay, and uh, as a result of the new birth, I'm now in the kingdom. You can take her out if you need to, and if you need to. Uh, I've come over to the kingdom of God, and in the kingdom of God, victory, we're going to see that in the text, has already been established. Okay, victory has already been won. Okay, now to partake of that victory, I'm going to number one need to find out what victory I have in each area of my life. I need to get acclimated with that reality, I need to be educated concerning the individual aspects of victory as it relates to my life, my provision, my health, and my purpose or my assignment, okay? Now, the way that victory is going to be appropriated is by the use of faith as though faith is an actual tool, okay? Faith is a tool that takes established victory in the realm of the spirit and pulls it over to the material natural realm 
and it shows up in our natural lives and what area we directed it in. We understand that, correct? Now, once I've gotten faith, once I've heard the word, and I'm starting to get an assurance of that word, getting convinced that the reality of what the word says is bigger than the situation that I'm facing, which seems impossible at times, then if I stop right there with just that assurance or with just that faith, if you will, then my faith will never actually perform anything for me because faith has to be released and faith is released through spoken words. Okay. So that's what we're going to really deal with. Now in the spirit, every time we go into a different area of study, uh, the Lord always speaks to me about me first and tells me, what adjustments and what changes I need to make. And it's always my goal to go right after making those changes. Sometimes in certain areas it takes me longer than other areas, but it's always something I'm going after. And uh, then he speaks to me about the condition of the ministry overall. Okay. Now, when he speaks to me about the condition of the church or the ministry, it's, you got to understand that it's not predicated on what I know uh, of anybody individually. Okay. You, you've got to see past that and understand that we minister in the spirit. So typically what's being spoken or preached about or taught about over the pulpit, uh, very rarely to be totally honest through the, through the week, am I in contact much with the people in the church? You know, and I, to a degree, do that intentionally. So I'm not aware much of your personal business and so forth and so on. So I can't be accused. Glory be to God. Of, <laughs> of, he preaching on me. He talking about no, 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 no. On the contrary, you should really conclude. Wow. When your situation is being mentioned, God is speaking to me. Because in most cases, there's no way I could know it. Now, does a preacher have a right to see the general temperature of his congregation and talk about certain things and know that certain things need to be taught on so that people can grow in certain areas? Certainly, certainly he has the right to do that. That's not sinful. That's not manipulative. That's not out of the scope of a preacher. And if you read Timothy, Timothy will talk in great detail. Paul deals with Timothy about some of the natural aspects of recognizing the condition of the people. Okay. So he should have some discernment about that. But where the prophetic aspect of the ministry is concerned, God is searching sort of our lives and, and it has a mailbox and he's delivering the mail relevant to the people that are dedicate, dedicated, watch this, to the fold. Does that make sense? Or that are assigned to the church or the ministry. Now, before I get into this, I got to say something really, really crazy right here. You ready for this? Watch this. Uh, particularly for the modern day church. It is absolutely biblical and necessary for the successful believer to build his or her life around the church. Wait a minute. Let me get back here where I got some protection. See, I can see it way before you throw it if I'm back here. Now, consider that I'm telling you that somehow now it's, it's the, the, the theology Satan has brought into the modern day church says that church shouldn't be an inconvenience to my life or that church shouldn't take away from my life. It should only be a part of my life. Boom. You are here to accomplish a, person, a purpose. And that's the reason why you are alive. 
as a believer, when you get to the point where fulfilling your purpose and your mission is no longer relevant, then you are closer to leaving this earth. So Paul made a statement. He said, for me to live is what? Christ. It's Christ. In other words, I live for the purpose of the anointing. Now, while I'm living here, the blessing belongs to me, and it equates to my fulfillment, my satisfaction, my effectiveness, my success, and my provision, but it's certainly not limited to that. All of that is connected to my assignment. And my assignment is not negotiable, okay? And my assignment cannot be accomplished independently of the institution of the church. Does that make sense? So it's not weird, saints of God. Don't let your friends tell you, uh, you always spending all your time at the church. Don't be moved by that. You should shout every time they say it, glory be to God. I'm telling you, in my personal life, there's no way Chelsea and I have, we have built our life around the institution of the church, the ecclesia. And it has produced every bit of prosperity we've had. It's produced supernatural babies. It's changed my family from devastation. You know, my family, we are, my family, we come out of the hood. The whole, our family is from the hood. You know, we come from some really rough places and God has turned it around to where we don't even have a concept of that life or that environment anymore. He's brought us all out as a family. He has placed us in a, in a dream state of living and we are happy, man, and we are fulfilled, and we are enjoying life, and the journey, man, is just phenomenal. And he's connecting us to great people and great things and things, the, the opportunity to go higher and increase in every area and help people and speak life into people and bless people is, is, is a constant reality, and it's happening. He's we had a lot of shame and dark secrets and embarrassment where our family is concerned. And we've watched God supernaturally turn that around. And we did it all centered around the word of God and the church. This family, this Cooper family has never forsaken the church. We have never put the church to the side to pursue our own interests. We included the church with our life pursuits. Does that make sense? So that's the norm in church. Now you don't hear that talked about in a lot of established churches because that's something that they were taught at their foundations literally 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. That was the norm. But when you have a new ministry like this, we have to mention that so you understand the foundation of the church in general. Does that make sense? Now watch this. First John, I better get to this text so I, before I miss it. I hear you, Holy Ghost. He said, I want this preached. Okay. So, uh, and I actually heard that just like that. Uh, verse five says, verse four says this, excuse me, that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now I want to point out the second half of this verse. The victory that overcometh the world even our faith. So that word uh, victory or that uh, word overcometh right here in the Greek is an interesting word, 3528 in the Greek, actually is translated this way. The means by which something is carried out. The means by which something is carried out. So in this case, the means by which what victory is carried out and appropriated concerning the world. Now the world right here is indicative of your finances, your health, your emotional well-being, your satisfaction, your purpose, your family, all of those things are affected by the earth cursed system. The earth curse, curse system is the system that is empowered to fail operating in the earth that 
came in as a result of Adam's sin. So we were born in a system where you would be empowered to fail at. You're not born emotionally sound. All right. So to be financially successful, even if you're born into a rich family, to maintain um, sanity and be productive with those riches, it's going to take work and effort. OK, um, you, where your family is concerned, your protection, these are things that are already in under attack or in a failed state where humankind is concerned because we were born into this earth curse system. Now, when we talk about the victory that overcomes the world, when you got born again, you will get manifestation over those individual areas, according to this text is your faith. So my faith heals my body. You see, my faith pays the rent. You, do you get that? My faith gives me a successful, meaningful relationship. My faith brings me out of my terrible mistakes. My faith corrects the wrongs <clears throat> that even I myself created and brought on myself. Does that make sense? My faith does this, not my trying hard, not my education, not even my determination. Now, is determination, education, diligence necessary? Certainly it is. It's a part of faith, but those things alone won't equate to success for those that live in the kingdom because those that live in the kingdom have been separated from the natural order of the world. Does that make sense? Now, Lord's been on me, says, Al, you got to make sure you simplify these things. So I want to slow down and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to present this somewhat how I present to my clients all over the country to a degree, because I really want you to get this. So uh, I'm going to be intentional concerning what I say here. Carried out is our faith. Now, faith is what? Assurance and what? So the victory, the means by which my healing is carried out is assurance or title deed of the word of God concerning healing. The means by which my rent is paid is assurance or title deed concerning financial prosperity. The means by which the victory or freedom concerning immorality or sin is actually brought into reality in my life is by assurance of what the word says concerning my what? Victory over sin, not the penalty of it. Does that make sense? Now, you're with me on that, right? You got that. That makes sense? All right, let's go over to Romans 10th chapter, verse 8. There's more I could say about that, but I don't have time. I'll tell you what, that, that thing just, is, just runs through me. Romans 10, verse 8. Now watch what he says here. Now remember, the means that my victory is carried out is faith, an assurance that comes from the word. Now, but what saith it? The word is what? The word is near thee. Now watch this part. The word is near thee. Watch this part. This is interesting. Even, go ahead and take her all the way out, please. Take her all the way out. Even in thy, watch this, mouth. Now look what we've talked about so far. Stop right there. Faith, word, mouth. Okay? Faith and words. We're talking about the word of faith. That's what we're talking about right here. So you could say it like this. 
the victory or the means by which victory is carried out in my life or appropriated is by faith words. The victory comes through faith words. Now the Lord said, Al, your church is having a difficult time speaking right now. The enemy doesn't want them. He's trying to keep you guys from talking or speaking and talking the blessing. Did, do you get that? He says, he, he says, Al, it's subtle. He said, because it's of a spiritual nature. What it does is, is you try to navigate life without actually saying or speaking to your problems. You see, you see here, it's when I get sick, it's I need to go to the hospital right away or I need to go get medicine. It's not, wait a minute, devil, take your hands off of me. I've been redeemed from the curse of sickness. By Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. I resist you now. Leave me. Take your hands off my body. He said, Al, they're, they're not. Right now, the enemy is doing something to keep them from fighting that way. Okay? And when the bill needs to be paid, instead of just trying to do whatever we can do naturally to get the bill paid. You know, whether it's a, a scramble or try hard or just close your eyes and go to sleep and hopefully the next day it's fixed. Glory be to God. You, you see what I mean? Same thing with relationships. Same thing with uh, contention with the people we come in contact with. Are you with me so far? And I felt this pressure too. And the victory, the Lord reminds us, comes through our words. Now watch. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and where? In thine heart. So, the word won't come out of the mouth until it first goes into the heart. Okay? The word must go into the heart. Then it comes out of the mouth. Now, we're going to get more into that. Now, watch this. <coughs> what word? What word? Look at the rest of the verse. That is... The word faith, okay? So faith words is where the victory is. And faith words work in the heart and then must come out of the mouth. We get that it needs to go in the heart, that it needs to go in the eyes and the ears. But if it does not come out of the mouth, nothing will change, right? Now, watch this. Look at verse 9. Now let me read verse 9 right here. Gets interesting. That if thou shalt confess with the mouth. Now, I need you to look at this word confess here. This word is extremely, extremely interesting right here. This word confess. Now, look what it says. Let me just say this. Actually, I, I tell you what, we'll go to verse 10. Let, let me, let's go to verse 10. I think you'll see it better right here. I'm going to stick with the note I wrote here. Verse 10, for with the heart, man does what? Believe. Believeth. Would anybody, could anybody tell me, what do you think that word believe, believeth means right here? Any guesses at all? If I was at work, I'd have a spiff for this. I'd be like, hey. I got a cash money spit for this. Glory be to God. Say it again. Woo, Chris, you but <laughs> Ain't number cards in there, Jesus. That's all sitting there. There's cards. Ain't no cash in there. Now I'm telling you. You got to catch me later. I owe you the Greek word pistos or pissed you up. All right? That is the word translated faith. So with the heart. Man has faith or man has an assurance or a title deed that he got from hearing the word. Watch this. Look at the next verse. The next words. Un 
to righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? God's what? God's right way of doing things. But, look at this. Now, that's with the heart. That's the spirit. Beyond the senses. And with the mouth. Confession is made. Now, watch this. In the Greek right here, if you were in the Greek right here, don't worry about changing it if it's, uh, if it's going to cut out. But in the Greek right here, the word confession is made is one word. In the Greek, it's one word. It's not, there are not three words right there. It's literally one word. And here's what it means in the Greek. Confession is made, read this way in the text. And with the mouth, he says the same thing as another. He agrees with and assents to a covenant. Let me say that again. Can you pull that up there? If you can, that would be great. If you can't, don't worry about it. But listen to this. Let me say this again. Let me slow down and say that again because it's so vitally important. With the mouth. Here's what you're doing with the mouth. Now, this is after you have believed in the heart. Now, don't forget, when you believe with the heart, that's where you get a revelation of what to do in your situation. God's right way of doing things that comes in the heart. You meditate on the word and it shows you what to do. It helps you to see clearly. Now, if you're not seeing clearly in your situation, you know what that means? What, what, what's missing there? Faith. What is it? What's missing? You have it. What, what are we missing? If Okay. We've, we're, we've started that. We got in the word. We got a promise, but we're not seeing clearly what to do. What are we not doing? Huh? What are we not doing? We're not meditating in the word how much? Enough. Sufficiently. Each situation you deal with has a different degree of revelation needed to bring forth manifestation in that area. You see what I mean? So when you reach a point to where you're getting frustrated in that area because you're not getting results, you need to go back to the word and spend more time meditating on that word so it can clear the darkness so you can see what to do. Maybe right here, okay? And maybe I need to speak to spend more time saying something to him. Devil, take your hands off of my stuff. Let me shoot that gun at you about five times a day. But you're not praying daily. So you don't have the energy to really use your faith. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or there's a natural thing that you need to be corresponding in in this particular area. Does that make sense? Now, watch this. For with the mouth, did we get that? Is it going to work? No. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. For with the mouth, confession is made unto. Here's what that means. Confession, the word confession here means this. If you're taking notes I would recommend that you write this part down. Number one, it means to say the same thing that you heard. Say the same thing you heard. That's number one. There we go, right there. There we go, let's go back up. Verse 10, great. I want you guys to see this. Okay, now look at this. I want you, for those of you online, we're looking at this on the screen. I really want this to be seen here. Now, right there, we see confession is made. We see that it's three words, correct? But there's one definition for those three words. And notice, stop right there, stop right there. Notice right here, confession is a verb. What does verb mean? It's an action word. This is not a noun. This is not a state of being. This is action. So, with the mouth, you've got to take action. What are you taking action with? The mouth. Now, watch this. Keep going. 
Now, this word, scroll back up, it's a compound word, okay? So two words in the Greek give us this word. Now, keep scrolling. I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Now, this is the part that I want you to see. For those of you using Blue Letter Bible, you want to be sure that you're looking at this in context so you know where you are so you don't get... Uh, off here. Is that, is that the bottom? Well, glory be to God. This is, show concordance results. Go down, scroll back down, click on the plus right there. Okay. Now, keep going, keep scrolling. Bear with me, keep scrolling. Is that, is that it? New Testament. Uh, is that it? Okay. All right, watch this. Number one, to say the same thing as another. In the context of the scripture that we're reading it in, Paul is talking concerning people coming to Christ. So what is it that he's telling the people to say, which we preach? That if thou shalt believe in thy heart, if thou shalt do what? Confess with thy mouth or say the same thing as another. What is he telling these people to say? Say what I preach to you. Right. You see? Now, in the context of you studying the word for yourself, getting your own promise, then you need to say the promise that you've gotten revelation of that agrees or applies to your situation. Does that make sense? Now, when it came to, when I was in the basement and I, um, the Lord gave me a word, prophetic word concerning starting my company, there are cases where there's not always an exact specific scripture that's going to say, Al, go start a company. You, you know, you won't always find that. And so you've got to be listening to the spirit of God and letting him lead you. But a word is necessary, whether it's through the mouth of a trusted man or woman of God, like your pastor, your prophet, your partners, or the actual scripture itself. Now, whatever you hear from the man of God shouldn't contradict the written word, but you need a word. And the word that I heard him say, in that particular case, I had a word, and the word was, God said, you're not going to have to leave the work of the ministry to go make a living for yourself. You don't have to abandon the ministry to go make a living for yourself. And for me, at the time in my life, this is not everybody's situation, practically impossible. It was, it was very, very difficult, and it, it's, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, it took away a portion of their lives. And so I knew that wasn't the case, that that God didn't want me to do that, but I still didn't have this total release to go ahead and start the company, to go that direction. And when I heard that word, it spoke to me, Con confirmed, and it was something that the Lord had already been dealing with me on, and the principle of entrepreneurship was something that was already in the word, and watch this, I had seen it in the word. So you see, prophecy and the inner witness is confirmation of things that the Lord has already been dealing with you on. It doesn't contradict the word in any way. Does that make sense? Is, is, is that confusing? Do you get that? Well, maybe, Pastor. I don't know. We still, uh, I don't know. Well, let's move. Now, to say the same thing as another, watch this, to agree with an assent. When you go and minister the word of God to people that are not saved, I'm talking about you as an, even as a non-preacher. First of all, you have the ability to go and get people saved. You have the responsibility to go and get people saved. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you brought somebody to Christ? Has anybody brought someone to Christ within the last calendar 12 months let me see a show of hands well glory 
Well, don't be ashamed about it. Don't be ashamed about it. If you have, go ahead and raise it. Glory be to God. Now, if you haven't, has anybody brought anybody to Christ within the last two years? If you haven't, you need to be about it. You understand? You need to. Your system is designed to stay functioning and running in the kingdom by sharing the gospel. All you have to do is share what has happened for you. All you have to do is share what prosperity you have or are experiencing. You don't have to get deep theological or preach. You don't have to do any of that. Share the good news of what's happening to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now watch this. What I need to do these people about a gospel and a God and a Jesus that was already established, who had already done the work that would allow them to enter into that finished work based off of them coming into agreement with it. Are you with me? So he wasn't telling them to get super deep and make up their own confession, if you will. He says, now that I've told you what to say, agree with it and say the same thing. Take action on it. Action is taken by saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now watch this. To concede. I'm taking away what I'm laying down, what I think, and I'm coming into agreement with what the word says or what God has said about it. You see what I mean? Like, I don't agree. I don't feel, watch this, it could be, I don't feel like I can't hang out with this person that I know sleeps around and drinks and smokes. You know, I, I like this person. Like, we have fun. This person makes me laugh. You know what I mean? Like, this is my homegirl right here. I like, you know, uh, Chelsea and I, before we got delivered, I had a, uh, I actually had a homegirl, okay? It was a, a girl that I put in the friend zone, you know, really attractive, pretty girl, but I just put her in the friend zone because I had gotten out of prison and, uh, you know, I was in a new area, didn't really know anybody. I don't know who this is for, but the Lord, the Spirit is leading me to tell it, so I might as well tell it. Glory be to God. <laughs> and uh, gotten out of prison, didn't know anybody. The one thing I did understand is that if I got to hanging about out with a bunch of guys again, I'd probably go back to prison. So my lightning fast mind, as Brother Copeland says, I figured, well, let me hang out with just females. And so I met a female that was like, you know, really attractive, and we just got really close, and this female just had me going out to clubs 24-7, partying, hanging out, life was a constant party, and just somehow I just put this person into a friend zone. You know, I couldn't never see this person beyond that or past that, and person obviously saw me a little different, so forth, but, um, and we had just a really good chemistry um, years before previous going into two marriages is the history that she and I had. Chelsea knew this woman and everything. Well, after I came to the Lord and uh, after we were delivered, even though I didn't have that kind of relationship with this person, the Lord, when people find out that the change is taking place in your life, old friends will try to get in touch with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Women, old boyfriends will come out of the blue, glory be to God. They may show up in your dreams first and then show up in person. When that happens, it's spiritual. At times, covenants are cut, a grudge of thoughts about a woman that you haven't seen in like 10, 15 years. You know what you do? You better cast it down, glory be to God. Amen. Let me tell you something. It ain't God. <laughs> <laughs> It ain't the Lord. Glory be to God. Now, you know, some believers get super deep and say, oh, glory be to God. God has put this person in my heart. I'm supposed to go reach out and witness. Honey, don't worry. The Lord has told me. No, no, no. He told you no such a thing. Don't do it. Don't do it. Right? Now, I put this person in and the Lord said, Al, cut her completely off. 
no conversation, no nothing, no connection whatsoever. And they did it. It was done. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't know who that was for. Now, I agree with what God says, not what I feel. I concede right here. Keep scrolling. To declare, keep going, to profess, what am I looking for? To pray, celebrate, keep going down. Is there something under there? Now, let me, let me give you this. In the Greek here, you won't see it all from Blue Letter Bible. I just know this from studying myself right here. Now, the Bible is written in covenant terms. The Bible is all about covenant. Listen, you to really yeah. so when you are speaking faith words, you are actually declaring the covenant benefit rights that belong to you as a believer. You didn't get it. I need to. You're going to get it. I, I see that, Lord. You're going to get it. So I'm a, you're going to get it because I'm going to say it from this side. Now watch this. When you are saying the same thing, what you are doing is you are declaring openly the same thing that God already said because that is your covenant. So when you say, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed, yes. it's because your covenant has already stipulated that healing belongs to you. So God wants you to take what he has already provided for and what he has already said and then say the same thing. Right. That is how faith words start to work. So it worked for salvation. Whosoever God, he says, listen, agree. You see, I agree. I say the same thing. Lord, you died for me so that I wouldn't perish and have everlasting life. You are God. Come into my heart. You see what I mean? I, when I'm confessing that, I'm confessing the provision that God has already made. He's already promised in blood. I have a covenant with him that says he shall supply all of my needs. Now I need to say that same thing over my life. Does that make sense? Yes. In my situation. Now watch this. Now, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth man does what? Say the same thing as another. He agrees with. He and he assents to it by means of covenant appropriation. When you confess, you are appropriating your covenant rights. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that not good news? Yes. What kind? Are we at a funeral? Are we? At, I'm preaching better than y'all saying. Amen. Glory be to God. Have mercy. It's okay. I'm used to it. Now watch this. Now that word unto right here means this to enter into that's heavy did you get that yeah. now watch this for with the mouth I say the same thing as God says and it causes me to enter into something isn't that amazing? Why didn't the writer just write that? Why did he have to get all spiritual right here? Why did he just didn't write, I'm going to enter into by saying. Do you get that? Your confession is what allows you to enter into the provision that has already been made. Now watch this. In this particular verse, what are you entering into? Salvation. Click on salvation right here. What is salvation? It's more than just getting saved, right? Salvation, soteria, is the Greek word right there. Keep scrolling. I enter into, keep scrolling, 
well, however you bring up the definitions there, Strong's Info. Okay. Yep, however you do it. Uh, okay. I enter into a Bill Winston now. Glory be to God, Sister Ravella. <laughs> I enter into deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation, deliverance from the molestation of the enemy. In an ethical sense, that which concludes to the soul's safety or salvation. Salvation as a possession of all true Christians. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right, now consider this. Salvation we know is more than just getting born again, getting saved. When you are healed, that is a form of salvation. When your bill is paid, that is a form of salvation. When you're supernaturally delivered that from a situation that you've been believing for, that is a form of salvation. Now, wait a minute, let me stop. Is that how many people do I have in here that are right now using their faith for something? Okay. Don't let me talk you into it now. Everybody except for Christian. Glory be to God. She said, I ain't believing for nothing. <laughs> I ain't believing for nothing. Don't ever get out of my business. Don't get in my business, Albert. Leave me alone. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, you need to be believing God for something. That's right. You are taking the beauty and the joy out of life if you're not believing for something. If you're not using your faith, you're backpedaling, Jesus. you got to be using your faith. Now... Confession is how I enter into it. So I want you to write this. I manifest by saying. I manifest by saying. My miracle is manifested by saying. Isn't that interesting? I enter into my miracle by saying. Saying what? Saying what God said. Saying the same thing that God said. Saying the same thing the word said. Does that make sense? Okay, I got to move. I've worked that all I can. Okay, if you ain't got it, I'm, I'm gone. I'm moving. I'm moving. Now watch this. Now, so we understand that the premise of faith words is this. That I'm going to actually be confessing words that God already said. Now what does that mean about you started on a tangent of confessions and you have no word to back up your confessions. You've not deposited any word in your heart because you remember this verse out of the abundance. What does abundance mean? Say it again. Overflow. Out of the overflow of the what? The heart. Then what happens? The mouth speaks what's in overflow in the heart. So if you're speaking and the heart has not been filled yet, then what's actually happening in the jar? What's happening in, in the cup? Can anybody tell me? Can, can, any, can anybody back over here tell me? Any, any of the brothers? Can, what's happening to the cup? This, this is very serious, right? This is, this is life changing when you get it. What's happening to the cup? that I'm pouring water in that is empty. What's happening to the jar, the container? It's being filled. It's being filled, right? But victory doesn't come until, it's until it overflows. Right. Do you get that? So when you take the shortcut and just go the confession route, he supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He supplies all, all graces about it towards me, making me sufficient in all things he's about. I'm about to every good work. He provides my water. He provides my bread. He prosper. I'm empowered to prosper in every area of life. Are those bad? No. But you can be confessing for years and years before your miracle actually shows up. Because it works best when your cup is already overflowing. God, you see what I'm saying? Amen. When it overflows, the mouth or your confession becomes voluntary. 
You see? Amen. It doesn't become a strength. So when the Lord says, Al, we're having a hard time speaking, what is he saying? Al, we're not overflowing. We're not overflowing in deposit. You see? Now, I know I, I, I want to move past this. You would think like that, Pastor, you already hit us with this before vacation. You come back and you write back on it. Yes, that's how it works. Lord gets on me and I get on you. I relate it to you. That's how it goes, right? That work. Now, listen, you can go years delaying your manifestation because you're not willing to take the time or engage in the something big. When you're believing to be healed of a terminal disease, you don't have, you may only have six months to live. You 60 days to live. You don't have time to try to fight that whole thing by confession. You need to use God's system the way he says use it, okay? Listen, when you have the diabetes, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, these things are killers, ladies and gentlemen. They are set up, eventually, they will run their course in your body if something doesn't change them. So you have to, under, you have to conclude, either I'm okay with allowing this thing to kill me and cut my ministry short and affect how I'm going to live for eternity because I'm going to heaven because I'm saved, right? But the quality of my living in New Jerusalem is signed to, to rule and everything. It's that serious, okay? And how I'm going to live is dictated by my productivity or my production level here. Profitable servant. The unprofitable servant comes over into the next life and whatever he's accomplished is sort of taken away. The profitable servant comes over to the next life and gets increased added to whatever he produced here. The kingdom of God is twofold. It is both now and the next life. They're connected. You are building by principle uh, a life right now that is eternal. You're not going to start working on heaven once you get there. Heaven for you is starting right now. What you're doing, what I'm doing, this is why, you know, I had a conversation with someone today in my office. And I said, uh, and uh, the subject came up, he said, you know, the subject came up and I'm paraphrasing this, you know, I can do anything to make a living, you know, I can... I can do. I don't have to run a company to make a living. I I know how to use the word of God, and I know how to be saved, and not sin, and use the word, and prosper individually without pastoring the church. This so question came up. Well, why do you do it? Because I'm assigned to do it. Praise God. Duh. <laughs> because I'm assigned to do it. Because my eternity is connected to it. Do you understand? I understand that I'm responsible. I have to give an account to God for what you notice we're not talking about heaven and hell right here. You see? Religion puts everything over in a heaven or hell context. I'm saying for you, believer, already saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, the quality of how you live for eternity is going to be dictated by what you're doing right now. You know what that means? You don't have any time to waste. You don't have the liberty, to be totally honest. It's not the best idea to be Rebellious. Sometimes the Lord can tell you to do stuff that you really don't want to do. I'm telling you, I wanted to go to California. Flat out. I love Columbus having to stay inside before we committed to ministry. We dreamed, honestly, of a life where we would just, let me, let me just say, anybody, there's a, has anybody ever seen the vacation vlog shows? Don't say any names on camera, okay? Don't say any names. <laughs> We found out the Lord revealed to Chelsea, she had gotten really heavy into watching these vlogs. And what she found herself doing, and me too to a degree, is living vicariously through 
the vlogs and what they were presenting as a fulfilling, happy life, exciting lifestyle. So what they were portraying is just traveling all over the world, you know, doing this, seeing these sites and so forth and so And the spirit just started nudging us. It was like, hmm. Chelsea one day, she's like, you know, I don't think these people go to church on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> definitely know they're not going to Bible study. I bet you they definitely ain't going to no Bible study. And... Uh, and we noticed that they would go in every of these different countries, they would partake of the cultures, you know what I mean? Go and kiss the Buddha statue. You know it's not good to kiss the Buddha statue. You know it's not cute. You be able to kiss that statue, that statue is a point of contact and you give a demon permission to enter your body. You understand that? You gotta, okay, this is not fun, it's not cute. TV, social media makes you see, it, it's not okay. It's not, don't do it, you just don't do it, okay? Um, Rick Renner had a, a case as a pastor. I, I'm, I'll get back to this. Uh, Rick Renner had a case in his church. He's over in uh, over in Russia, and uh, he had been teaching his church. Rick Renner is a world-renowned uh, ministry right now. He's a Greek scholar, word of faith Greek scholar, one of the few in the world, word of faith, or real word of faith, yeah, partners yeah. with KCM Ministry. Yeah. And uh, he is considered like the apostle to the Iron Curtain uh, era, all right? He, the Lord told him to move from America where he was comfortable over to Russia and take his family and pastor over there, right? And uh, at any rate, he's teaching his church, and he had told, the Lord had told him, he said, tell your church when this group comes into town, he said, and this group is not supposed to be going over there, running over to this meeting, you know, and you know how... Church, how people can get in church. People insist on having their own rights. I'm an adult. I do what I want to do. I'm grown, which is a rebellious mentality. Usually when you get to talking like that, there's been a covenant cut that you don't, you're coming into agreement with. You're entering into some sort of witchcraft, even at times in the area. But uh, there's people, you know, what they did is just didn't mention to their pastor that they were going. Now the person that went was actually somebody on his staff. This was one of his core people on his staff. And she had had, uh, I believe diabetes it was. Don't quote me on that exact disease, but it was a disease where if she didn't take her medicine, uh, an ailment that she would die. And so she uh, went over to this meeting where this prophet was holding a meeting, you know, searching for the supernatural, you know, missing, looking for the uh, spectacular, skipping over the supernatural, looking for the spectacular. Spectacular is a manifestation of principles applied from the word of God consistently in one's life until it becomes on purpose, not balls out of the sky, right? Looking for some excitement, you know, so she goes over. You're healed, you don't need to take any more medicine. Hear that? What do you think she did? Well, stop taking the medicine. You know what happened? She died. And here he is having to tell the family, and he's telling his church, if you don't listen to what God says, these are the situations that you put yourself in. These are the predicaments that you get in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, why did you have me say that? Hmm. That's interesting. I have no idea, so I'll get back to my text. Now, watch this. I'm almost done here. Um, <clears throat> turn over to Hebrews. Um, or Actually, turn over to Proverbs, the 18th chapter, verse 21. Proverbs 18 Verse 21, you know, thank you, Lord. At a point, ladies and gentlemen, there is going to come a point on the earth where the word of God will not be as easily or readily accessible as it is now. You are going to have to scramble. You are going to have to really work to be able to hear the word of God. 
before the rapture comes, if you're still here on the earth. While we have it, we need to cherish it. We need to hide it in our heart, I'm telling you. Now, look at this. Proverbs 18, 21. Let's read that. Death and what? Death and... This is a... You know, this is a quiet church. You know, I have been in churches with five people, boy. They run you out of the room. They get so loud. You know, just so you know, you got permission to be loud. It's okay. Death... I'm not going to declare you're not a, a quiet church in Jesus. I speak crop failure. You're full of boiling energy and enthusiasm <laughs> concerning all of your church services, all of your opportunities to praise and worship and celebrate your God. Ooh, I like that confession better. Glory to God. Now watch this. Death and life. Now, life right here in the Hebrew is defined this way. Life means that which is lively, that which is fresh, that which is flowing and reviving. Okay? So death and that which is lively, that which is fresh and flowing and reviving are in the power of what? Tongue. The tongue. Now, that word power, I know we've preached this in the body of Christ for so long, but we've missed some things right here. That word power is not dunamis, okay? It's not dynamite, kind of, that's not what it is. The word power right there actually means means or direction. You see that? So that which is free-flowing, that which is lively, that which is renewing and refreshing is in the means or the ability or the direction of the tongue. Do you see that? My tongue has the ability to direct me towards that which is free-flowing, life-giving, refreshing, renewing. Do you see that? Yes. Now, my tongue or my words in and of themselves, my words are not the power to do that. But my words or the use of my words and my voice and my tongue mixed with something else can produce that. Wow. Any idea what that is? Faith words. Saying the same thing God has already said. Watch this. If right now in your life, if you're not experiencing liveliness, fresh flowing, and reviving aspects of your life then you know what that means that could possibly mean you are not confessing God. you're not talking That's good. what are some things uh, reviving he restores my joy mm -hmm. my youth is renewed like the eagles the joy of the Lord is my strength it's working for me right now you see, when you're talking the word and saying God's word, what he said with your tongue, now power has been connected to you, and it will result in manifestation that you what? Enter into. You see what I mean? You enter into these benefits by mixing God's word with your mouth. Does that make sense? Well, that's good news right there. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Now watch this. Watch this. Death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it or reciprocate it consistently. In the Hebrew is the idea right here. Consistently reciprocate it or engage in it. What? Shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, we know that life is there, reviving, but your mouth with God's word in it will produce death. 
the power to fail. Watch this. You don't need God's word in your mouth to speak death. Without God's word in your mouth, by proxy, you will automatically release death. You see? The word is what revives you from the curse. Without the word, you're leaning to your natural disposition, which is empowered to fail. See, when you got born again, your spirit got saved, but your mind never changed. Do you know you have the same mind that you had before you got born again? It's still in there. Did you know that? You know what has to be done with that mind? What has to be done with it? It needs to be what? Well, you learned a subscription over here, ain't you? Subscription. It must be renewed by what? By the word, right? I'm telling this just excites me to no end because this is me. Uh, uh, this is working in my life. Now, let's close out with this. Verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Let's see what he says right here. How did you, Jesus? Have mercy. Oh, right. Either this hot or that's the Holy Ghost. One of the two. Cresha, let's go turn it down a couple more notches there, actually. Now watch this. Hebrews 1 and 3. Go up two verses there. Scroll up two verses for me. All right, let's read this. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, hath in these last days, talking about after the resurrection, in these last days spoken unto us by who? Who is his son? Jesus. By Jesus, right? Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who made the galaxies? Christ. Jesus. Jesus made the galaxies. Did you know that? God used Jesus to make everything. You understand that? Jesus was the word. Right. Now, look at verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory... That means, you remember when Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? What he's in part referring to, to look at in human form. Does that make sense? And the express image of his person. Watch this. This part is crucial. And upholding all things by what? The word of his power. He is upholding all things. Now, that word upholding means this. To move, to execute, to apply, and to manage. To move, to execute, to apply, and manage. So, he's saying here that God is moving, executing, applying, and and managing everything that's in the world by what? The word or by words. By words. Everything in this world is moved or changed by words. That's right. Scientifically, you can measure, we've been able to measure the things that are in the realm of the material by vibrations. Has anybody ever heard this? Yeah. Vibrations can literally move and shift objects and change them. Vibrations. Words create vibrations. Literally, hospital, there are studies that show that a person that speaks negatively while they're in the hospital sick dies quicker than a person that speaks good things over them. You see that? A person that speaks negatively concerning their health has a much harder time recovering physically than a person that is speaking life over their health, over their body, right? He upholds all things by the word of his what? 
It's power. It's the real definition of power. It's power. Watch this. God's power follows what? His word. Power in our lives follow words. Everything in the kingdom that you pull down is a byproduct of believing and saying. Words. That's how we get it. We get it all by believing and saying. I got, listen, let me just say this. The Lord mentioned this earlier to me, and I'm going to close out right there. The Lord mentioned this earlier to me. He reminded me of my marriage. You guys know when Chelsea and I first got married, those of you online that don't know, uh, when Chelsea and I first got married, we were in a, um, a place to where, you know, we really maybe needed counseling. So we entered into a marriage. Actually, Chelsea kind of gave me an ultimatum. She was like, she was like, dude, like, we're getting married this time or else. The first ultimatum, she goes, we're getting married at this time or I'm going to Spain. Okay. And I was like, Gina, 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 no, Gina, Gina, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll consider it. Had people at work tell me, like, man, you better not let her go, bro. You better get, like, you know. And they weren't hearing from the Lord. And now, then I said, uh, then uh, we, we got closer to a date. And she was like, okay, this date or it's done deal. And I said, okay. But then I was like, hey, I just need to move it back one more week. Something happened. I need to, it's huge. I can't, I need to get some money first. You know, I'm broke. We got to have somewhere to go on our anniversary or on our honeymoon, right? You know, you want that. It's like, okay, one more week. Well, that one more week came. We went to the justice of peace. You ever heard of the justice of peace? You know where that is, don't you? The courthouse, straight courthouse action. That's what we did. We went to the courthouse. And uh, I was with my brother. She was with my brother's girlfriend. And uh, they had showed up. She had told me to go get some khakis and a white shirt. And uh, I had no idea. I was supposed to get, like, the kind of khakis that, like, Brother Eric had for his wedding and a white shirt. But I missed it and got something totally different, right? <laughs> and uh, so I was a little late, I guess, showing up. And she got there, and I wasn't there. And, uh, and my brother's girl was like, see? I told you, you know, I told you, oh, I can't believe he did you like that. Here I am showing up. Dun, 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 here, it's me. But, you know, I wasn't really smiling or whatever. So we get married. When we get married, we have no idea what marriage is. No idea in concerning the two of us. I had already been married previously for 13 years. But, and, you know, how to adjust and compromise with each other. We had just no idea, no plans, no sort of premarital pre counseling, you know. Statistically, pre people that talk to somebody prior to getting married, their marriage is going to last longer. When you don't talk to, when you're afraid to talk to people before you actually get married, and that implies that you're, you're trying to hide. That implies somewhat of a manipulation kind of mentality. You need to be open. You, you don't need to be a secret island. You know what I mean? You need to be accountable. The kingdom is all about accountability. We don't have secret lives. We don't do our own secret thing. You know, we live out in the open, not in the, not in the darkness. Does that make sense? And uh, so... Here we are, so we go ahead and get married. We're not accountable to anybody. We don't talk to anybody. We just do us. We weren't walking with the Lord, so forth. And um, we had so many terrible problems in our marriage between us. Um, we had men trying to reattach themselves to her, women trying to reattach themselves to me, one woman called one day and manifested over the phone and said that I'm going to kill myself if you don't come and be with me right now. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm, a, I'm married and I'm a believer. And she was like, well, doesn't God want you to reach out to people? I was like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, but it's manifesting like really crazy. I mean, so much 
pressure and uh, and I had the the woman on speakerphone and Chelsea and I at the same time were, were rebuking the girl in the name of Jesus devil you a lot devil we break your power right now and at one point she said why are you treating me like I'm a demon I was like because you are right now that's why I, glory be to God and we just kept persisting and then that devil finally backed off and waned and we never heard from that person again and this person was like I'm going to show up at your house and this person is actually somebody who had uh, I had a history uh, I was stalked uh, before I came to the Lord actually legitimately real life stalker and this person just would not let go and uh, so you would think that in a case like that we need to be talking to somebody right can can maybe if not a counselor at least the police right <laughs> and uh, we had infidelity in our marriage we had distrust we had anger issues towards each other i mean all kind of issues now i kid you not now listen before i say this let me disclose this god has grace on a case by case situation in our case, there was nobody around. There was, so we didn't have a church family. We didn't have anybody to have been there. Because after we got delivered, our heart was for the Lord. We wanted to do what's right. Now, I'm saying to this, to, to you, for those of you who got a lot of single folks in here that plan to get married, the folks that in here that are already married, the recommendation is not that you do your own thing. Okay, you don't, don't, dead was the word. It's all we had. There was nobody to call, man, nobody. So what we did is started feeding on that word day and night, and it supernaturally worked out all of our issues to where we were able to start living a life as husband and wife without strife. To this day, we are anti-strife in my home. Amen. Praise God. Thank there is no such thing. Listen, men, you don't sleep on the couch. Women, you don't force them to sleep on the couch. You hear that? That is ungodly. You don't use intimacy as a weapon in any way. You use intimacy as a weapon against your spouse. You are getting over into the curse. You are opening yourself to the enemy. And you're opening your spouse to the enemy. I don't care how mad you get. Husbands, they try to put you on the couch and I ain't going. It's my house. I pay rent right. I pay this bill. You talk about did I go to work last week? It's my house. I don't care if your name ain't on the house, it's still your house. You're the priest of the home. You don't go sleep on no couch, women. And uh, we just started using that word and it counseled us through our issues hmm. now get a balance here you don't judge this right you'll pay the price again no counseling at all promise you you won't make it on your own that's not how it works people that descend save you can fall out of love you can hurt each other to the point to where you may not be able to return so you don't waste words and just say anything and do anything to your spouse. You need to reverence your spouse. Men, you reverence the women. Women, you reverence the man. You see with your husband. You don't go into, listen, listen, you married folks, let me tell you, men and women, let me say this. Might as well go and get on you, have mercy. No use of you coming in here talking about praise a good Lord, pastor, glory be to God, God is good. And then turn around on the way out the door and talk about, come on, gosh, to your spouse. You see, get in the parking lot, talk bad to your spouse. Just praise the Lord with the pastor, with a, now talk bad to your spouse. Theoretically, you shouldn't have more respect for another man than you do your own husband. Don't use your leadership as a weapon against your spouses. 
Now, what would uh, now? Don't get me wrong. It's healthy. My, even in my home, my wife and I will say, "Babe, you remember what Brother Copeland said? He told us that doing this." And typically, when we say that, we're talking on I terms. Yeah, I remember Brother Copeland said this, and Bill Winston said, "I need to. I, I'm gonna. I'm doing that. I see that, but not as a weapon against each other." Pastor said, "You are not supposed to do that, and you're doing no, 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 no. That will be ineffective." You are going to injure that person. When the person is offended by you, they won't receive anything you got to say. You've got to minister to them in a way that is use other people as weapons. Don't get into things like this. Like, we well, see, this is how you always do this. This is how you've always been. Even back then, 10 years ago, you always did this. That is not playing fair in a godly marriage. Those things will cause problems. Allow your spouse the right to grow past anything they've done in the past. That may have been what they did, but that's not who they are. You, peep, Your spouse needs permission to grow past the things that you've called them out on. I don't care if they've been, I mean, I've been a low down, dirty, shame bum. And I needed my wife to forgive me so that I could look up and move forward and grow. That's right. And she's so glad that I did grow and move forward because in turn, I've been a blessing to live the same way privately that we do publicly. Does that make sense? Yes. Speak life. Be kind to each other, man. You need your spouse. Prosperity requires the both of you being on the same page, loving each other. You actually say I do. You've got to ask yourself, you know, what is it going to be 10 years down the line with this person? You've got to think about those things. Don't compromise. What you compromise to keep, what will happen? Glory be to God. Did you get something out of this today? Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, let's stand. And we are going to um, get ready to dismiss. Right before we dismiss... We are going to worship the Lord concerning our giving. Now, uh, really quick, when we give, your tithe confession is a declaration of your covenant. So when you're giving and you're, when we confess, Lord, I thank you that you brought us out of darkness into light. You're our very own father. You've placed us in Canaan. We prosper continually. Those are your covenants. To come to you and invoke. Now, yes. in Jesus.